Hello everybody and welcome to module 12-2. Now we're going to be looking at how to perform tests of independence. In other words, do we have evidence to show that one variable is somehow dependent on another variable? These types of tests, the mechanics, the methodology that we use, very, very similar to what we did in module 12-1. Those tests are on equality across multiple proportions. The mechanics, the calculations, the methodological approach that we're going to be using is nearly identical. So if you feel like the calculations that we're about to do, they feel very familiar to you, it's because they are. We did them all in module 12-1. Now the nature of the problem is a little bit different, but we're still comparing an observed frequency, and here you can see in front of you, we've got a similar looking table of observed frequencies. We compare those observed frequencies to an expected frequency. That expected frequency, as you might guess, is what we would expect the value to be in the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So all of that is the same as what we did in module 12.1. If what we observe is very similar to what we expect, if the null is true, then the difference is going to be very small. It will be close to zero. If what we observe is very different from what we would expect to observe if the null were true, then those differences are large. And so the nature of our test statistic is exactly the same as module 12-1. We're looking at those differences. We're squaring them. We're converting that to a chi-squared test statistic. And this is going to be still an upper tail chi-squared test. Do we have evidence to show that those differences are large, in which case that supports the alternative, or are those differences small? We have small chi-squared, and that would support the null hypotheses. So then let's get into this. There's a little bit of terminology that we'll want to learn, but otherwise you will see the similarities. I am sure of it. A local animal shelter is interested in knowing if people's decision to adopt a pet or purchase from a breeder, if that is independent of the type of pet. Knowing which pets are more likely to be adopted will help them manage their inventory. So here's our table of the observed frequencies. Now, this is written in a fairly particular way because we have different types of variables. We have different names for our variables. Here we're doing a test of independence. We want to see do we have evidence to show in the alternative that one variable is dependent on another. So we look at our variables. We've got type of pet and we have the decision to adopt or to purchase. Here what we're looking at is the type of pet is what we call our explanatory variable because we have reason to believe or we're wondering if the type of pet explains people's decision, whether they adopt or do they purchase. This is our response variable. So the decision to adopt or to purchase, is that dependent on that explanatory variable? Does it depend on if it's a cat? Does it depend on if it's a dog? Does that decision depend on if it's some other type of pet? So we have our explanatory variable as columns. We have our response variable as rows. Okay, so let's go from there. First step, formulate the null and alternative hypotheses relatively straightforward here. We don't have any fancy symbols or anything. Our null hypothesis is simply that the two variables are independent and the alternative hypothesis is that the two variables, you guessed it, are not independent. So the null hypothesis is that the decision to adopt or purchase 
is not dependent on the type of animal. The alternative hypothesis is that the decision to adopt or purchase is dependent on the particular type of animal. So the response variable is dependent on the explanatory variable. Here we're going to use that 10% level of significance. So again, that's, ex that's stating our level of comfort towards a type 1 error. Now, so much of this is going to be the same as 12-1. We need to calculate what we would expect those frequencies to be if the null were true, if they were independent. Well, if they were independent, well then again, we can treat all of these proportions as being equal, which means that here we surveyed 357 people. Of those 357 people, 183 said that they would like to adopt. So 183 out of 357, 183 out of 357, that gives me a proportion of 0.513. That is the proportion of our sample that said I would rather adopt. And that is regardless of the type of pet. 51.3% of those surveyed said that they would adopt. Similarly, one minus that, or 174 of 357, said they would purchase. So that's 48.7% said I would purchase. So again, if those variables are independent, well then we would expect 51.3% to say I'd adopt a cat or a dog or other, it would be the same across all of them. If the null hypotheses were true and our variables are independent, then I would expect 48.7% to purchase, regardless of which particular type of pet. So, same idea. We apply those, those proportions to our three samples. So here I'm going to say, well, for those who want a cat, I would expect 51.3 out of those 98 to want to adopt. And so that would give me an expected value here of 50.27. Similarly, if I move along that row, I apply that same value, 513, to dogs. There's 133 people who I surveyed who want a dog. That would be 68.23. And applying that same value to other, so 126, gives me my expected value here, 64.64. Same thing across the purchase. Again, if the null hypothesis is true and they're independent, then it doesn't matter if you want a cat, dog, or other, I would expect 48.7% to want to purchase. So I apply that value, 4.487, times, I'm coming back here, 98, and that expected value would be 47.73. I apply that same proportion, 487 times 133, and here I would expect 64.77 and 0.487 of 126. 61.36. So those are those expected frequencies. If the null is true and these two variables are independent and the decision to adopt or purchase is not reliant on a particular type of pet, these are the frequencies that I would expect to see in my sample. So now we calculate the rest of our test statistic. That test statistic is, again, that same chi-squared. It looks identical to what we have already seen. 
we're looking at the difference between what we see, what we would expect if the null is true. We're squaring those, dividing by the expected value, and adding those all together. If there's a big difference, and the observed frequency is very different from the expected frequency, squaring that gives a much larger value. That's going to cause that test statistic to be larger and make it fall further into that upper tail. So once more, this is a upper tail chi-squared test. The test statistic is only going to be large if the difference between what we see and what we expected to see if the null is true is large, which gives us evidence that what we expect is incorrect. And of course, that then supports the alternative hypotheses. So I'm going to go through the same type of process, looking at those differences between what we observe, what we expect. Then I'm going to square those values. Oops, where'd that come from? Then I'm going to divide those squared values by what we would expect, again, under the assumption that the null is true. And I add all of those up. And somewhere down here is going to give me my chi-squared test statistic. Okay, so we'll start off in the adopt row. I'll go across all of the adopt, and then we'll do all of the purchase. And I'm not going to write out each and every one of these. Um, you'll see the pattern. It's a very similar pattern, in fact, and you'll see the same kind of shortcut that we saw in module 12-1. So this first one, again, we're looking at the observed, which was 60 minus what we expect, 50.27. So 60 minus 50.27, that gives us 973. I square that. And then I divide it by that expected value. And that gives me 1.883. Now we do the same for the next 62 minus that expected 6823. 62 minus 6823 minus 623. I'm going to square that. And then I'm going to divide by 68.23. And I'm going to continue on. Finish off the adopt row, and then I'll come back, and we'll do the same on the purchase row. So that next one is 61 minus 64.64. That gives me minus 36245 squared divided by 64.64. And now I'm coming back to the purchase, and you'll see that same relationship. Here I'm going to have now 38 minus 47.73, and wouldn't you know it, negative 9.73, right? It's the same and absolute value that we had up there. So when I square it, I have the same, 9467, but this next column is not going to be the same, right? Because this next column here, we divided, right? That division was 50.27, but now we're in that purchase row. So now I'm going to divide by 47.73. And so that gives me 1.984. Okay, and moving on, now I've got just a couple left. The next one, here I can take advantage of this shortcut, right? I know this is going to be 6.23. 71 minus 6477, oops, 71 minus 6477, 6.23. squared and now I'm going to divide it by 6477 
0 0.599. And finally, one more, 65 minus 61, 36, 364 squared is 1325 divided by 61.36 216 and that's it now I'm going to add up so I have 0.216 plus 0 0.599 plus 1.984 plus 0.205 plus 0.569 plus 1.883 and that gives us a chi-squared value of 5.46. Oh, one of the more tedious, not the most tedious, don't worry we'll have more to come, but it's one of the more tedious calculations. So here we have our test statistic. Now, which, uh, which chi-square distribution is relevant? What are our degrees of freedom? This one's a little bit different because in this type of problem, unlike the previous problem where we had just a yes or no response, so we only ever had two rows when we were looking at the test for equality across multiple population proportions. Now, I can have more than just two. Here I have, in my rows, here I have two rows. And here I have three columns. In this type of problem, we can actually have many, many rows, many rows this way, and many columns going across. So the degrees of freedom calculation is a little bit different from what we saw before. Remember in, in module 12-1, we only had yes or no responses in those rows. So that was always two. But here, depending on the type of problem, and maybe we'll see some a little bit later, we can have more than two rows. So our degrees of freedom calculation here is going to be r minus 1 times c minus 1. So the number of row values multiplied by the number of column values. So here this becomes 1 times 2. So in this example our degrees of freedom is 2. So that gives us the particular variant of the chi-square distribution that is relevant to us. Our test statistic is 5.46. We're doing, whoops, we're doing this at the 10% level of significance. So let's go down to our chi-squared table. Here we are at two degrees of freedom, 10% level of significance. There's our critical value So here's that chi-squared, here's our critical with an area of 0.1 in the upper tail. Of course, our test statistic was 5.46, so we are here. And of course, remember that critical value, like always, defines our reject and our do not reject space. And certainly we can see that our test statistic, well, it lies between these two values. 5.46 is between our 4.6 and 5.9. And so that tells us that our p-value is somewhere between 0.05 and 0.1. And here I can see, well, the p-value that corresponds with 5.46, well, certainly it's got to be something less than 0.1. So, let's come back up here. We have a p-value that is less than 0.1, greater than 0.05, with a level of significance of 10%. We certainly have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypotheses, which means that here we have evidence to show
that these two variables are not independent, that the decision to adopt or to purchase is somehow dependent on the type of pet that is being adopted. So of course, well, okay, so here we've gone through parts A, B, C, and D. We've got our conclusion, we interpreted what that meant. Let's go one level deeper here, and let's look at, you know, how can we get a little bit more information about the type of relationship here that exists? We see, we found that there's a dependency. What does that dependency look like? So we can kind of quickly, I'm going to do a little bit rough here. We can look at these sample proportions and get some idea of the nature of that relationship. So I'm going to clean up some space here. Let me just clean up our expected values here. And I'm going to clean up a little bit of room here as well. Because we can use, in this case, a bar chart to help show graphically what that relationship looks like. So in order to do that, I'm going to need to calculate all of the point estimates, all of the individual proportions, and then we'll develop a bar chart and will give us an, the ability to see graphically something about the nature of that relationship. So I'm going to first calculate the proportion of those who adopted a, or those who, who want a cat, the proportion who adopt the propor proportion that would purchase. And I'll do that for all of the cat, dog, and the other. So for the first one, I'm going to go 60 divided by 98. So 60 over 98, that gives me here a point estimate of 0.61. So 61% of those surveyed said that they would adopt. Looking at the dog, 62 divided by 133. And so here I can see 40, I'm just going to round it to two decimals because we're not going to be very precise here. 47% of dog owners would adopt. And for other, 61 divided by 126. This is 48% um, of other pets would adopt. Similarly, if we look at purchase, now I can just do one minus those other values or I can just calculate 38 divided by 98. So here I have 39% would purchase, 71 over 133. Here I have 53 would purchase, 53% would purchase, and the next one 65 out of 126. Here I have 52% would purchase. Okay, so what can I do here? Well, let's, let's plot these and get some idea of how they look relative to one another. So I'm doing this very roughly, okay? So here I'm going to do in blue, I'll do the adoptions. So if I compare across the three types of pets, so here's cats, and this is a value of 0.61. Dogs somewhat less at 0.47. And other about the same. This one was 0.48. And now if we look at the decision to purchase, so now I'm looking at these point estimates. Well, now I have, for the cat, I have 39. So that's somewhere down here. For the dog, that's 53. So that's a little bit taller here. And for other, we're at 52. So now it gives me a fairly good idea of the nature of that dependency. For cats and cats alone, there's a much greater preferences toward adopting 
cats than there is for purchasing cats. As opposed to dogs and other pets, they tend to be very, very similar. That decision to adopt or purchase seems quite close, quite similar for dogs and other. Maybe there's a small preference for adopting, uh, no, small preference for purchasing dogs and other pets, but we'd have to do further analysis to know whether or not that is statistically significant or not. For the purpose of the, the dependency relationship, here I can see quite clearly that cats are unique compared to those other two. There's a much greater preference towards adopting cats as opposed to purchasing them than there is for the other types of pets, dogs and other. Okay, so that concludes our first problem uh, on how to test for independence. We'll come back. We've got a couple of other problems to look at, and hopefully, again, we'll go through some practice. You'll get the hang of it, and surely you see the similarities here between what we've already done in those previous problems. Okay, thank you all for watching. I hope this was helpful. Bye-bye.